<laughs> and thank you, uh, yeah, thanks for making time. I think Dr. Cantu had a, a lot of really good points, and I'm going to um, probably reference those a few times. I'll, I'll try not to go too fast, but I get excited about this topic, and there's so much I want to get in. So uh, if we could just advance that first slide. Yep. Yep. Uh, the plus there. So I'm going to go over a couple. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'll go over a couple principles that are, I think, um, important. In fact, two that I want you to take away. Um, one is <coughs> the idea about rotational acceleration. We'll come back to that several times. And the period of vulnerability, particularly for young athletes, uh, but anyone with a concussion. Um, I'll go over briefly, very briefly. I won't put you to sleep with the physiology, but I think there's a couple points that are important that, that are common questions for patients and parents in the office about what really is a concussion. And it actually makes a big difference when you talk about prevention. And that's our, that's our focus today is prevention. Um, so why is it important, particularly for youth athletes? Well, there is this window of vulnerability uh, for the athlete who's concussed. And we're, we're going to lay out a very common scenario and, and quickly you can see how easy it is to have an athlete at high risk on the field. So let's take American football, for instance. If someone goes across the middle, gets hit, knocked out, it's fairly obvious to everyone in the stands, on the sidelines, parents, everything, right? So that athlete will be addressed, head and neck uh, assessed. Most folks would agree if they're loss of consciousness, they're probably not going to be put back in the game. Um, and so from the beginning, that athlete will have a very obvious, very visible injury that everyone agrees upon as treatment and pr very likely less, have a little bit less pressure on them to return quickly. The much, and the loss of consciousness, by the way, is only 10% of, of concussions. Uh, in concussions, only 10% include loss of consciousness. So imagine the much more common scenario, someone who's not the ball carrier on the side, maybe, you know, uh, kick off uh, away from the play, gets hit, get in, gets injured, doesn't feel quite right, either doesn't recognize it or is unwilling to, to report it or, or for whatever reason continues. That athlete's actually more likely, very likely going to continue with that play, with that game, with the the school and, and practices that week. And I'll tell you that the folks with the most difficult outcomes, the ones with most likely to have prolonged recovery and consistent problems would be folks who have multiple collisions during this period of vulnerability, during the time when they're injured. More so even, uh, so they'll have exponentially worsened symptoms uh, with collisions that would otherwise be fairly well tolerated. So normal shoulder collisions or normal practices. When they're injured, when the athlete's injured, their, their, uh, their symptoms not only would go exponentially uh, worsened but by multiple collisions uh, during the injury. Um, but uh, we'll just go back for one second. Um, but there is the syndrome, the very scary syndromes like second impact syndrome. That's where there's collisions in that period of vulnerability which really can create brain injury. Um, so we'll talk about the, the period of vulnerability again in a few minutes. But for young athletes especially, they can as Dr. Cantu mentioned, physiologically they're different. They're not just small adults. And so there's actually quite a bit of difference between the way their brain develops, the way their head and neck muscles are uh, stabilizing. And of course they have several decades of, of school and sports that, that they can accumulate injuries. They have unique responsibilities as well. So the student athlete has really two big jobs. They may really enjoy and, and identify themselves as an athlete, but their, their main occupation is a student. And even, especially junior year, even an uninjured athlete has sometimes a hard time keeping up with the volume and the intensity of school anyway. So you can imagine trying to do that during uh, injury or making up schoolwork uh, when they've missed a week or two or more recovering from concussion. So we'll go on there. So I want to talk about the, the injury itself because this is an important point, again, that may not always be obvious. Concussions occur primarily because of rotational acceleration. What that means is the brain, which is a soft mass in a hard mass in the skull, will move along with the skull at the same, same rate. If it hits an immobile, immobile object like the ground, the skull will stop, the brain will rotate and shift in the skull. And that causes things that Dr. Cantu mentioned, like axon stretch or axon structural damage, which is not typically evident on typical MRIs uh, or CAT scans that we use. So that's why you'll hear people say that concussion is largely a functional injury, because it looks fairly normal on standard MRIs and CAT scans. But what happens is, the reason this is important is because when we talk about prevention, we're going to talk about head and neck strengthening, core strengthening, basically trying to reduce the 
the violent rotation, okay? It's not just linear. In fact, it's not a whole, it's not a large degree of contact that causes the concussion. It's a rotational acceleration. And there's some pretty interesting studies going back 100 years. Uh, even folks in slaughterhouses knew this very well. And bear with me for a second. The way they would sacrifice an animal is they would bring a cow in and they would basically try to knock it out before they uh, do bloodletting, basically cut the jugular vein. And the, the folks in slaughterhouses knew for sure if you bring the animal in and you fix the shoulders in place, um, and if you fix the head in place and drop this heavy bolt on the animal, it'll get very mad. There'll be maybe skull fracture, but generally they won't have loss of consciousness. You fix the shoulders in place, leave the head uh, able to move, drop the bolt, there's a big rotational acceleration. Generally, there's loss of consciousness and presumed concussion, of course, for that a animal. And that's where it's felt to be a bit more humane to cut the jugular. So again, I, I apologize for the, the visual, but the point is, is actually really important. It's the ac rotational acceleration that's important. And we'll talk about helmets. That's partly why helmets have been disappointing uh, in their ability to prevent concussions, although they, they do a good job preventing skull fractures. Um, so we'll go over a couple, um, uh, a couple strategies for prevention. We'll go on to the next slide, please. I won't bore you with this except to say the concussion, once it's established, to a large degree is an energy crisis. It's not a bruise on the brain. It's, it's generally not a large degree of swelling. It's not bleeding. That's different. That's a hemorrhage. But concussion is, like we said, a, to a large degree, a functional injury. Imagine each brain cell is actually, well, it, brain cells work on glucose. Uh, that's their fuel. And there's a, there's a problem with rapid depolarization of the brain cells. Basically, they can't transmit the, the uh, signals that they need to. And the brain cells need glucose to, to regenerate that, the polarization to, to work properly. If we go on to the next slide, there's a, there's a busy slide. Basically, just we could talk about the physiology quite a bit. But I think the next slide actually um, is important. This one, although it looks busy, it, it, it does help me think about the period of vulnerability. This is the demand for glucose. Right after the injury, basically the brain cells need more glucose for recovery and regeneration. But it's exactly that moment where there's decreased blood flow and decreased oxygen delivery to each individual brain cell. And so this goes into part of a return to play criteria, but the point is during this this period, it's exactly when the brain, is, the brain cells are asking for more fuel, and it's actually exactly the time where they're getting less fuel. So this is where we institute very aggressive rest, physical rest and cognitive rest. Although um, we've, we've done some papers to show that after a period of aggressive rest, for a week for instance, we can reintroduce very light to medium uh, exercise or light to medium cognitive challenge. High intensity cognitive challenge has been shown to prolong recovery, but the light to medium um, uh, cognitive challenge um, showed that it was is basically similar to no cognitive challenge. And that really has an implication for the accommodations that students um, have in school as they're recovering. Again, that's probably the most difficult, I find the most difficult part of managing concussions is the school part of it. The physical part of it, of course, it's fairly easy to say we need to keep you out of contact sports until four criteria. Symptoms are gone academics are tolerated, exercise stages are tolerated, and then typically we do some kind of computer, uh, some neurocognitive testing. Typically it's uh, computerized. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is just the idea of that period of vulnerability. And you'll, you'll hear from, I think, uh, Kathy Thornton about return to play stages and overall management. We can go on to the next one. Um, this is what I mentioned. You'll hear more about this in, in some of the other breakouts, but the criteria for re return to play really are those four things. Resolution of symptoms at rest, academic tolerance, exercise tolerance, and then some type of neurocognitive testing. Is this out of contact sports at any time? Well, again, what we do, what I do, and, and I think most folks do, we do a period of aggressive rest, cognitive and physical rest for the first three to five days. Now. Beyond that, as you get into week two and definitely week three, you really run the risk of physical deconditioning, cognitive deconditioning, social deconditioning. If you're just telling them sit home, sit in the dark, do coloring books, don't do anything. 
it gets very complex very quickly. So with the study we did that showed low to medium intensity cognitive challenge doesn't prolong recovery. We feel like once, uh, once the athlete or student athlete can do some degree of reading, we'll send them back to school half days or full days with accommodations, trying to avoid the highest intensity cognitive challenge. And there's a good paper, I have references at the end, uh, the pediatrics paper called Returning to Learning uh, helps lay out some of those principles. Not just really, they don't go much into return to sport, but return to school. And I like to have people do stretching and walking at least at the very beginning for physical activity. Once they tolerate full days of school, we may introduce a stationary bike or some light, very light to medium non-contact exercise. We don't consider contact until we see really all those four criteria. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. So we'll talk about a couple of strategies, but it really starts with the team, the coaches, parents, and medical staff. You really have to have an agreement. And I think having a regimented sort of checklist, having a clear criteria, okay, and if I'm in an appointment with a patient and parent, I'll probably say it's like a mantra. Like I'll, I'll just talk about those four criteria over and over so the athlete knows clearly at home what, you know, where they are in their progression, how close am I to trying this or that. We'll try to lay out a strategy to say, I want you stretching and walking every day. Once you can tolerate, let's say, three days of school well, then let's put you on a stationary bike for 15 minutes. Low intensity, I tell them conversational levels, as if you can keep a conversation with me. Uh, later on, we go to medium intensity, as if you have to sort of take a breath now, right? But it's still low to medium intensity, non-contact. And I'll lay out those strategies. But really have to have agreement pre-season among the coaches and parents, athletes for sure, and say, regardless of the situation, playoff game, last two minutes, if we see these criteria, we need to have, we agree all together, without argument on the sideline, we're going to withdraw. And we're not going to return until we, we meet these agreed upon criteria. So the agreement and communication is hugely important. Um, Preseason testing, we do computerized testing for a lot of athletes to get a baseline computerized test. We, we can use that as a snapshot and reference that computerized uh, impact test, for instance. If they have an injury later in the season, we expect them to have at least as good or better performance on that particular test if we're going to say this person's recovered. Um, and this is, a, you know what, uh, Dr. Cantu talked about this at the end of his, his talk, but it's probably among the biggest parts of prevention and management. Changes in practice, and I think he laid it out extremely well. Sub-concussion collisions are, uh, it's, I really think that's the biggest part of CTE. Um, if you picture, especially what goes on with Division uh, One football now, it's year-round, really. There's no off-season, particularly for those athletes at the higher levels. And he mentioned quickly the, the cannon fodder. He's talking about the folks who may not be starters. They may even be undersized or, or maybe even not as conditioned as the starters, if you will, but they're put in positions as tackling dummies. The, the linemen, the standard normal play is high-intensity collisions multiple times, literally, and they've been tracked thousands of times. And if you, talk, if you look at high-level athletes at D1 or professional, I really think they may have a, an unusually high threshold, a high personal threshold for concussion, where they may, not be, they, may not be, they may or may not be hiding or not reporting symptoms. I think a lot of them don't actually have symptoms sometimes, but they are getting huge uh, uh, forces with repetitive sub-concussion collisions. Um, so you can picture maybe running an ultra-marathon or, or several marathons on knees that you've numbed up. You may not have knee pain, but the repetitive impact is going to take a toll at certain points. So keep that in mind. Changes in practice are effective and important and really need to be thought about. So he touched on that a bit. That's just something I want to emphasize again. Um, prevention, again, strategies, we'll talk about a few more, but I mentioned that because they are not effective at stopping rotational accelerations, helmets, um, skull caps, even headbands and soccer, have been disappointing in, in preventing concussions. They're good at preventing scalp injuries and skull fractures and facial injuries. Although remember, with any addition uh, of equipment comes some unintended consequences. So when they added the helmet in football, and certainly when they added the face mask in football, tackling changed immensely. Uh, skull fractures and deaths went way down. Uh, cervical spine injuries went way up. Then they made some other rule changes. Again, another good strategy, rule changes spearing tackling uh, really helped decrease the rate of cervical spine um, injuries and quadriplegia. So that was a rule change. 
But remember, if you go before that spear tackling rule change, people were dying from skull fractures in the, you know, in the, in the, early, uh, in the early days of football. The helmet stopped the skull fractures, but didn't do much to change uh, concussion, particularly once the tackling techniques were different. Very different tackling techniques in rugby, for instance. And you don't see a lot of sub-concussion collisions in rugby, although there's high, uh, high intensity collisions. Um, mouth guard, same thing, disappointing in the Did fact that... Did you say something more about that rugby? That? Well, rugby, they tackle differently. It's, the, it's in the rules, and there are no helmets, of course, and there's no face mask, so you won't lead with your head. Um, and if you do, you'll know it very quickly, and you probably won't do it again. Um, the design of rugby is not line up collision, line up collision. There are rucks, and, and, and just the style of play is not repetitive collision like offense and defensive linemen. The numbers, and, and some of it has to do with the access to brains or access to athletes, but the number of football players in the, in the brain lab with CTE is far, you know, far higher than, than the rugby. And that may have something to do with it, the design of the game at its very base. Uh, so helmets and mouth, mouth guards have been disappointing for preventing concussion. A lot of research is still going on, and, and now helmet makers are at least thinking about r slowing the rotation, spreading out the force. So it may be that there will be equipment answers to prevent concussions. Right now, it really is not any reliable data to say this is superior to this product or this is going to prevent your injury. Communication, of course, is hugely important. Remember that the athlete on the sideline who had got hit and maybe it wasn't visible to all of us on the so you know, uh, uh, as medical sideline people or coaches, that's the athlete that's going to really be at high risk for accelerating his or her symptoms in that period of vulnerability. So communication is hugely important um, and willingness to sit out if there's some suspicion for concussion. Thank you. Uh, rule changes, a couple interesting things. We mentioned spear tackling it changed cervical spine injury, the rule change uh, back in 1976. Last couple years, NFL has done some interesting rule changes with really um, uh, higher penalties, even fines for certain types of hips, hits. They changed, the way, you, you may know this, but they changed where the kickoff starts from. So the number of, act, number of uh, returns, the number of touchbacks changed uh, significantly. So a touchback is where, you probably all know this, where there's a kickoff, but the, uh, the receiver for the ball takes a knee. There's no collisions or no tackling during that play. So that decreased by over 40% with this one simple rule change. And uh, concussions, uh, no, uh, concussions are decreased by about 40% uh, related just to the kickoff. And overall, among lots of rule changes, the NFL reported that there was a total decrease by 12% um, in all concussions for all plays. Um, there's some people who, who wonder about the accuracy of their numbers, but the idea is still sound to decrease exposure when they can. We'll move on to the next one, please. Pop Warner has changed some things too, and I think this is important too. They've changed the way they're, they're tackling, so they, won't do, they can't do drills now where you line up more than three feet apart and do collisions. So they can still do linemen uh, collisions like a standard play, but they used to do two on one where they get 10 yard he running head start and collide with each other. So there's, there's changes in their rules that are, make sense, but I think that's going to be um, more, I think more of that has to come about in the practice setting. You can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this. I think this really belongs more in management, but how long is too, how many is too many is a common question for parents. It's hard to say for sure. Clearly when there's injuries with decreasing force, so instead of the, the blindside hit, hard hit, big rotation, you know, sometimes kids will come in and say, well, this is my third concussion, and this one, I don't know what happened. It was just a shoulder collision. I went up just a simple head the ball in soccer and got all these symptoms. That's concerning, even more so than the big, heavy collision that you sort of expect a concussion from. If it takes longer and longer time for uh, recovery and if there's incomplete recovery, persistent headaches, lack of school performance, those are really key uh, components to considering retirement or sitting out for a year or other things like that. So. Uh, and then at the McKaylee Center, we do active injury prevention. So uh, if, if you go on, we basically have the athletes come in. We do, we do several dozen measurements, their head and neck strength, their range of motion, hip flexors, hamstrings, their core strength, their balance strength. We, we take all these you know, dozens of measurements. We take their history, their sport, their position, gender, age, of course, and we put it into a database that we created. And basically for each sport, we know there's a certain number of, of likelihood 
you know, injuries. So female athletes uh, in the teenage years, uh, there's high risk of ACL injuries in soccer and basketball, for instance. We also know hip abductor strengthening, you know, stabilizing the knee to prevent this valgus collapse. We know that can prevent ACL injuries. So we take these measurements and we get a personalized take home prescription for them to say, this is your personal risk for these particular injuries. These are some of the weak points. Here are exercises, let's address them and prevent them. So we can go on to the next one, please. For concussion, and go ahead and on to the next one if you don't mind. Uh, for concussion, we really work on head and neck strengthening, right? If you, if you know NASCAR, they have these active headrests. The, the drivers are locked in with seatbelts at their head. When they hit the wall or hit another car, it helps prevent this big, violent rotational acceleration. Not really practical for the lacrosse or football field, but the internal stabilization is what we're trying to work on, right? The head and neck, the upper back or periscapular strengthening. Core strengthening, now, now core and, and balance strengthening and, and, and uh, practice, of course it, it'll improve performance, but if you picture like a soccer, two soccer players going out for a header, if there's insufficient head or neck strength or core strength of the, uh, you know, core and balance strength, there's the more likely to be sort of awkward falls and the rag doll hitting the, hitting the ground or just the violent rotational acceleration to the head. So we feel like that's an opportunity to improve Probably, uh, probably performance, but reduce concussion rate. So that's part of what our, our goal is going to be. Um, then other strategies that we would work on with the athletes as well, impact anticipation, hockey players uh, in particular, learning uh, where you are in relation to the boards, your body position. Instead of putting your head in a vulnerable position, keeping your head up, knowing when that hit's going to come. Stick athletes, I tell them, if you're going to start lacrosse, start early, early, early with stick handling. You don't want that athlete focused so much down here and, and cr worried about creating the ball, because guess what? They're going to, someone else is coming to, to probably deliver a blow or deliver a hit. So we want to have them comfortable with stick handling so they can look around and anticipate or avoid collisions. And so I'll wrap up here and hopefully um, have a few moments uh, for questions. but. The bottom line is strategies would be have a low threshold, an agreed upon low, th low threshold to withdrawn athletes that's su suspected of injury. The hardest ones are the what used to be called grade one concussions, the, what people might call mild concussions, but again, that's controversial to say mild anyway. But the ones that are not obvious, that's the athlete that's at high risk. So having a willingness and agreed, you know, agreed upon plan to withdraw the athletes that may be injured is I essential. Um, you know, we, we touched briefly on return to play criteria, but if we don't have a structured, regimented um, return to play criteria, it's hard to know when should we return this athlete back, back to athletics. Um, it shouldn't be based on playoffs or you know, time of the, you know, what the score is or, or if the team needs them. I hear that a lot. The team really needs me. Um, and I'm sure they do, but it's really about risk prevention. And remember the window of vulnerability for that particular athlete. Rule changes, I think we should still be thinking about that. And practice changes, I think those can be really effective. Um, and then when we think about equipment or active physical strengthening um, prevention, we're really, to some degree, talking about rotational acceleration. Can we reduce that violent action that we feel like is a big part of uh, concussion itself? And if you can go on there. All right, so I'll wrap up there. I'm going to put the next slide up. Uh, just to leave it up because there's some suggested reading. It includes the, uh, the pediatrics paper on returning to learning. There is a really good paper on um, uh, high school sports that breaks down the, by each sport, male and female, the rates of concussion. Yeah, thank you. The, the rates of concussion by sport, football, ice hockey, men's and women's uh, basketball. So I'd, I'd, uh, I'd encourage you to, this is essential reading. You may, of course, you probably have already read this, the consensus statement that Dr. Cantu was talking about. It's fairly quick reading, but it's really the base of where we, we're really talking about this terminology. Rates of injury, um, and then the, the act, this is what I mentioned. Uh, this is our study that we did to demonstrate the effects of high intensity versus medium and low intensity. So if we had high, high yield reading, I think this is all high yield reading. Uh, high, uh, high yield reading. This is a book um, that's a little different than the, the academic papers, but probably best for coaches and parents. 
Um, so I'd encourage those at least. And if you want to know more about what we're doing for injury prevention at the McKaylee Center, certainly welcome to uh, check that out. And we have a table downstairs too. So I know I talk fast. Like I said, I, I get excited about this. There's so much I want to keep, I want to at least deliver because some of this stuff may not be intuitive when, you, when you're watching games or, or trying to, to get kids to do um, to good performance you know, on the field. But I think it's important to talk about, and I congratulate you all for being here. So thank you. Yeah. And we'll, I'll take some questions. Uh, Neil, are you speaking in here next? No, I think I'm in the next room. Okay. Okay. So uh, I don't know what our timing is, but you just wave me. I think what would go till 11 or so? But I'll be happy to answer questions. You had a question? You were talking about the Kelly Center yeah. for prevention. Mm. How do you get those students in? Is it insurance coverage? Yeah, good question. Although, and, and so no, it's generally not insurance covered. Um, there are, uh, so even though globally we're talking about prevention and we know that's the most cost effective way, insurance companies won't cover it right now. So it's generally out of pocket. We have um, scholarships for athletes who, who uh, have need. And in fact, we're, we've had the scholarship program for a while, but we haven't given all the scholarships. People are just haven't applied much to them. So uh, I'd encourage you to look at, at, the, uh, at the website, and, and especially if there are folks in need, uh, there are some scholarship programs. But right now, unfortunately, it's not co uh, insurance covered. Yeah. Yes? Do you recommend or do you utilize our standard Mm -hmm. uh, I do. I do. I think it's I think it's good for recording and keeping track of, of symptoms and plan. When they come into our clinic, um, we have our own um, academic accommodations. We have sort of our own personalized paperwork because we see a lot of of these athletes. So we have I have my, my own um, fairly long note to schools that will check off what, what parts of the accommodations we want them to institute. I will lay out the, the return to play stages, but basically I'll send them along with a sheet that says, I want you at stage zero, and if you tolerate a full week of school, stage one, and I'm gonna see you back next week or two weeks anyway. Don't go beyond that. So is your plan, tell us specific, that is your plan is based on that particular state plan, or just, but it's more detailed? Yeah, so correct, okay. yeah. And Oh yeah. Well, it's hard. Take you at least a half an hour, and you're sometimes yep. traveling back to back. Um, but again, that that care plan, I think it's it's great as far as helping coaches and yeah. staff and teachers and parents specifically. Yeah. Um, which again, it takes a lot of time, but I think it's it's ideal. But I think you have to go over and over because I think for us right. as a professional, we can understand it, but but it, it is a little bit complicated as far as sending yep. it out to those, uh, you know, to the coaches and to the parents and and mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Play, you know, or you know, she's going to be in her in soccer tournament, or whatever yeah. the sport might be. Do you have any suggestions as to? Um well, I'll, I'll say a couple things about that. Um, it, it is the one of the hardest diagnoses. I mean, to, to manage. I mean, ankle sprains, even ACL tears. The management's fairly straightforward. The folks that we're seeing in our clinic, in particular, a, a large proportion are folks who've been managed very well by their pediatricians, but they're not getting better. So. We're seeing really complex cases, and, and it, it gets hard, especially with school. And, and in fact, there's a good study that showed uh, symptom duration is actually significantly higher during the school year than it is during summer years. It was a good study out of Minnesota recently. But the point is, yes, it takes a lot of hours, a lot of dedication. There's the same questions almost all the time, and I've considered, make, I'm gonna probably do it soon, is make a little video for the parents and patients to watch of the most common questions because there are top 10 questions that come up all the time. Re the pressure to return, um, it's there, although it's not as much, again, for my population, patient population, it's um, a lot of times they're coming in, they're really struggling with school, they're struggling with symptoms, so they maybe have moved a little bit beyond the point where they say, uh, 
they, they generally know something's wrong and, and I'm struggling. So, yeah, and I actually find, even though that's really frustrating and, and, and eye-opening, I don't find the parents are so much saying, hey, Johnny's got to get back in or Jill has, you know, has to get back in. This is not an injury. Most of the time, they're just, they're really struggling. In fact, they've read some of the popular literature about concussion and they come in really worked up and, and nervous and anxious, sometimes even, I think, disproportionately so. I think they really get scared and some of these concussions are doing well and recovering. And so there are some folks who are sort of talking off the ledge a little bit, but um, all I can say about that is I, when, there's, when there's not really a good recognition, um, we do, I think the computerized testing, some objective measures can, can help. We do a symptom score sheet and we'll, I'll just sit down with them and say which of these symptoms were not present before the injury. And when they say, well, I never had headaches before. Okay, how often are you getting headaches? Well, every day. How's your school performance? Well, now I'm getting C's, I'm, I'm near failing math. When we just lay out some of these pieces and I say, well, when's the last time you tried exercising? Well, I, I played basketball with my brother la you know, two nights ago and, and I felt, how'd you feel afterwards? Oh, I felt pretty sick, I missed school the next day. When you lay it out like that, they usually say, okay, wait a minute, I guess I see what you're saying. Yeah, there's no fractures, there's no blood, but things are not the same as pre-injury. So it's tricky, it's hard, uh, and, and it's a really tough, it's a tough diagnosis to manage because there is fear and the, the school part of it just can't be overestimated because it really is big pressure. In fact, I find most of the pressure the, the student athletes come in and, and they're worried about, especially the good students, they're really worried about their school work. They know the, the materials building. It's hard just to keep up, let alone make up. And so the pressure really affects anxiety, uh, sometimes depression, sleep quality, right? Um, that's a huge part. If I have a second, um, I mentioned briefly deconditioning. There's a physical deconditioning very quickly. If they're home sleeping all day, they start not sleeping at night, they're not exercising. So if you just interrupt someone's sleep for two weeks at a time without any concussion, guess what? You're gonna have most symptoms on those lists. Daytime irritability, trouble concentrating, often daytime headaches, fatigue. Um, so the nighttime sleep quality is hugely important. That's why I'll start, start them with light exercise as soon as I think they can tolerate it. Even if it's just stretching and walking, it gets them moving a little bit. It may help with nighttime sleep quality. We'll have them skip naps during the day if they start not sleeping at night. I'll consider melatonin and things like that for nighttime sleep quality. But it gets very complex and if they're out of school for two weeks, that's a huge chunk and they're well aware of that and the pressure builds quickly. Yeah, question here. Dr. Brian, my colleague and I are high school nurses. Mm. We found that after doing so many of these that we're not starting to tell people to keep their kids home a good two to three days mm -hmm. just right out of the gate. Agree. We have done in the past. Yep. We've seen that that's made a little bit of difference in the speed of recovery. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you recommend that that be our? I do. In fact, that's an excellent point. And both my parents were teachers, so any day out of school is a huge deal. So I, I, I resist that, but there's good studies. Bill Meehan uh, did a study that showed um, that time, some short amount of time with full cognitive rest, generally three to five days, sometimes as short as two that can really be effective, even if it's instituted later on in the, in the, in the course. At, at, it still can be effective. So I agree with that. It's not easy to do. It costs the student a fair amount, but it's high yield. I think it's worth it, yeah. Question there? Um, one question was just with the prevention assessment work that you guys do. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend, recommend kids coming to start that? Recommend? Um, it's a good question. I would say, again, it depends on sport, but I would say it's similar to the question that we have, when can ballet dancers do point work? It's when they can really follow instruction, frankly. I mean, we'll do it as early as even eight or nine, because these days, for better or for worse, it just is what it is. There is much more organized sports. Most of the time, kids are on multiple teams. And so the hours of exposure for everything, from ACL injury, shoulder injury, or concussion, is going way up. Rather than free play, where you go play kickball one day or baseball one day, it's they're specializing fairly early. So as soon as the athlete is considering specialization or if they're doing year-round sports, hockey now is year-round baseball, as, as you probably know, um, skating and ballet and gymnastics, there really is no downtime. So for all injury prevention, again, top to bottom, whether it's knees or hips or concussion, I would say 
if they're specializing or when they can uh, follow instruction. Because what they do, they don't keep coming to the McKinley Center. They go home with a set of instructions and they work out on their own or with their team or trainer or they, when they can do that, it works. So. Second question would be, where do you fall on the, on the monitors and the chips? That right, the okay, good question. So if people don't know, there are things like, um, there are two types, by the way, well, there's several different types, but one is, a, uh, I think Reebok puts one out that's a green light or something. If you, if you sustain a certain amount of force, and I think it's primarily linear acceleration, I don't think it's rotational, but anyway, so if you, if, if you sustain that force, a little green light that sticks out of the back of your helmet lights up, and you're supposed to go get checked out. There are other ones that are being developed that measure hits, total hits, and, and they may, some even have a radio transmitter that'll say, if it exceeds this 40 newtons, uh, it'll light up in the booth, and they say, oh, okay, go check out, uh, you know, number 22, he lit up. It's... It's got value in a couple ways. It's definitely not worked out yet. But if you do it for a whole team or a whole league, then you can identify things and say, particularly if you have hit counts or if you have number of light ups, you can say, well, why is this team having a disproportionately high number of, of hit counts or high, high energy collisions? Should we examine their practice habits or their tackling habits or their, their preseason workouts, things like that? Um, for a team, the same thing. For an individual athlete, you know, someone using it here and there, it's hard to say. If you, if you light up, for, for two reasons, if you light up, so to speak, should that athlete be out just based on that? I don't know. Uh, again, if they don't have symptoms or are traditional measures of concussions, you know, we'll do sideline cognitive assessments. You really can't do the computerized assessment on the sideline. The sideline assessment is the hardest. So, because you're making decisions. If it's not concussion, and this is hugely important, if, if you don't mind, I'll take a second here, because, um, if every athlete comes over to me, I cover football and assignment, if every athlete comes over and sees me, if, if I'm diagnosing concussion on every single one, uh, either my accuracy probably is not very good or not every athlete is coming to see me that should, right? I should have a certain percent that we check things out, things look okay, no concussion, go back. If everyone, I say, okay, uh, nope, you're out and you're out for a month, guess what? Very quickly, the athletes will say, I'm not going to see Dr. Ryan. That didn't feel quite, oh, that doesn't feel quite right, but I didn't get knocked out. I think, I, uh, I think I'm going to hold out. And I was told I'm going to have to retire if I get a concussion. And who is the most at-risk athlete? It's that athlete, right, that we don't identify. So we need self-reporting. We need accurate measures. We need specific measures um, to say you're injured or not. The light-up thing also has a second consequence, again, unintended consequences. If you're having just one team do it, not the whole league, or even if you put the whole league, there are, there's a certain uh, culture in so, some sports that says, I'm going to light you up, or I'm going to get this guy out, I'm going to get that light to go off. So you can be, a tar particularly if it's one or two athletes that are using it, their, their parents say, well, I want to use the latest technology. It, it's in rugby, if you tape up a knee, you're gonna, that knee is going to be tested. Someone's going to say, we'll see how much, you know, is that knee stable or is that going to bother this guy if I check it out? So we have to consider unintended consequences for those, but they're interesting, particularly for research tools, finding or measuring hit counts, and that's part of what um, Chris Nowinski is doing. I really think that's intriguing, hit counts, but I don't know yet that it's applied very well to on-field management, because it, it, there's so many variables on the sideline, it's really tough. Yeah, question here. Would you let your kids play football? I don't have any kids. Uh, I probably would, but I wouldn't, I don't think I, again, this is completely editorial, but I don't think I would, have him, him or her play Pop Warner. Um, the cervical spine is really not developed at that age. Uh, I like, I love the fact, maybe seven on seven drills, flag football, where you learn, you learn off, there's a lot of complexity to football. I mean, it, people don't realize it's, it's actually really fairly intricate and actually a pretty beautiful game. Um, but you have to learn a lot about offenses, defenses, assignments, um, blocking assignments, tackling technique. Um, I think I would, ha I would let them play football. I played football in high school. I loved it. I thought it was a big part of my development. You learn how to hurt, and, and, and if you're not injured but you're hurt, there's a difference there. You learn how to be tired and still work hard and work part of a team. So I think there's benefits there. Um, young athletes playing or specializing like year-round sports, just across the board, other, all sports, I'm not a huge, I, I think, uh, 
free play and changing sports seasons and playing different things is the way to go, in my opinion. But. How many years ago, there was a movement to ban boxing in the U.S. and mm. uh, it went nowhere, of course. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, is, is it across the board uh, in all cultures? Uh, this, may, this isn't a medical question, it's more mm. sociology, but the, this, the movement toward more and more violent sport and outside of sport, is, is there any way of curbing that trend or is it even worth trying? Oof. Well. It is sociology. I, I really think there is a, a big trend towards more violent sports. Mixed martial arts, again, athletically, it's, it's impressive. If you look at the athletes who did mixed martial arts 10 years ago versus the athletes now, there's completely different skill sets. They're very dangerous people. Uh, they do a lot of training in very different types of boxing, uh, jiu-jitsu, and on the floor, and upright and striking, and all this stuff. So the trend and the popularity for mixed martial arts is going through the roof. I was in Ireland speaking on concussion, and just the trend in rugby, uh, rugby union or rugby football, um, the trend is there is a difference in the way they're tackling. It's becoming a little bit closer to American football tackling. They're bigger, faster, stronger athletes for sure. The collisions are hugely different than they were 10 years ago. And part of, part of that is just there's more money so they can do year-round training. They're big, fast athletes. So the, cu the culture is, yeah, there's more speed and violence and collisions for lots of reasons. I don't know that we'd change it. I, I don't know that I can change it, but there's reason to consider that, uh, hope, hoping that it slows down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, for I, we haven't developed anything for concussion per se. Yeah, I would say there are some of that. Like I would have you look at the McKaylee Center website. FIFA 11. There's a FIFA FIFA, the, the International Football League. It's really ACL prevention, but uh, it's pretty cool dynamic warm-ups. It's called the 11 Plus program. That's actually um, well, very well done. Um, but that's injury prevention for soccer players primarily, but goes across the board. But the McKelly Center, I think, has information on that as well. It's a good question. Yeah. Has there been any um, work done with the top lawyer and the unions or activities going on between the clinicians and uh, top one leagues? Yeah, I've, I've um, spoken to some of the leagues and, and uh, some of the coaches come to uh, events like this. We're putting on a, a symposium, an all-day symposium on... Uh, on the 22nd of this month of, of spine and concussion prevention or, uh, and treatment. So they attend those things and, and we go to, we go to um, leagues and teams all the time. So I, uh, I'm going to wrap up, but I'll be here for questions. I'm, I'm going to try to be available this afternoon as well. I think there's a panel discussion. Um, so I'll turn over to the next speaker and I really appreciate everyone being here. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Oh, yeah. Good to see you.